Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonas Otterbeck. Uh, I'm a professor of Islamic studies at the Arab Khan University Institute for the, Mus uh, for the study of Muslim civilizations. Still, I've only been here for a couple of months, so I still have a hard time getting my tongue around that long name. I do prefer the abbreviated version. But it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to this book launch of uh, Hussein Ahmed Amin's book, The Sorrowful Muslim's Guide. It is published together with the Edinburgh University Press in association with the Aga Khan University and this Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. And the book is part of the series Modern Muslim Thinkers. Um, for those of you sitting at the back, it looks like this. It's a beautiful book. We do a price. What? We do a price. Yes. <laughs> uh, the series aims to broaden current debates about Muslim realities, which often <laughs> overlook seminal work produced in languages other than English. The series seeks to introduce new perspectives to the discussion about Muslim civilizations by identifying and translating critical and innovative thinking that has engendered important debates within its own setting. Hussein Ahmed Amin's book was originally published in 1983, but it remains a vivid intellectual analysis of the Islamic life in al qarn al ashrin the 20th century. Before we start, that was part of the subtitle, otherwise it's pretty much the title straight off. Uh, before we start the session, and before I introduce the speakers, I would like to invite you all to the reception after the talks, and I'm informed that it's in the room beside it's you. No. Okay, <laughs> nice. it's in our pantry, yeah. basically. So it's straight across the atrium in our staff lounge, so we'll show you the way afterwards. And then I can point out that if you would ever need a toilet, it's also in that direction, <laughs> and in the very unlikely event that anything would cook catch fire in this damp London, uh, you will easily find fire exits to the right and to the left. Now during the reception and after the talks you will be able to buy the book at a special reduced price and maybe Charlotte how much is that? Yes, yeah, so it's uh, at a reduction of 20% um, which hopefully will address your query. <laughs> um, so the price will then be uh, 40 but there's also just copies for display if you just want to have a little, little read and little browse. And there will also be other books on display. And there are other books on display as well. Right. In the same series and there will also be possible to buy some of them. Yes. Um, right. The next hour and 15 minutes we get the pressure, pleasure to listen to Nasreen Amin and yes, Amin, Amin, both of them translator of the book, and uh, Paolo Branca the author of the introduction, and Abdurrahman Azam, who is part of the Kitab project, and Leif Steinberg, who is director at the AKU ISMC. Now I get to use the abbreviated version. Um, I'll introduce them one at a time and let them speak. So the first speaker is Nasreen Amin. And uh, she's one of the translators of the book and also daughter of Hussein Amin. She has a degree in translation from the University of Bonn in Germany and has worked as a freelance translator as well as an external translator for the United Nations. Prior to this, she was a lecturer in Arabic and translation degree. And <laughs> that scared you. <laughs> Uh, translation theory and practice at the University of Exeter before moving to Cambridge, where she's currently an assessment manager for the University of Cambridge Exam Board, Cambridge Assessment. Please. Sorry. And we could politely give her a hand, couldn't we? Um, hello. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say something about the book and its author and also about the translation process. So um, the Salaf al-Muslim Guide, or Dalil al-Muslim al Hazim was uh, the first book published by Hussein Ahmed Amin, who was my father, in 1983. He was approaching the age of 50 and he was a career diplomat. This was his bread and butter job, which he quite enjoyed, but which he also felt was sometimes getting in the way of his real passion. He was a really avid reader and uh, every wall in our house was taken up by bookshelves. His library consisted of books on Western philosophy, 
um, Eastern philosophy, literature, poetry, history, and of course a vast collection of works on um, of classical Muslim scholars, as well as the works of um, Orientalists. You could say that he only started writing after he had built within him this arsenal of very eclectic knowledge and formed ideas at some, that at some point were bursting to come out and be shared with the world. When he started uh, devoting more time to writing, he turned his attention to the issue of Islam in the modern world. This wasn't just a matter of personal interest. It was the late 1970s, which in Egypt saw the emergence of groups like at takfir wal-Hijra, Excommunication and Exile, and Tanvim al-Jihad, the Jihad organization, who were spreading extremist ideology and who were eventually responsible for the assassination of Sadat. At the time, I think these movements were regarded as fringe phenomena that could be dealt with through security crackdowns and the like. I think my father felt that there was a need to be aware that the rise of political Islam and extremism had roots in how Islam had developed over centuries, from the time of the Prophet until now, and that unless we tackle the problems at the root, we would not succeed in confronting the danger coming from these groups. He felt that there was a more widespread ignorance of some basic and vital issues of the Islamic faith, and that certain beliefs and practices had crept into ordinary people's faith and established themselves as integral parts of Islam. He saw a pressing need to make a clear distinction between the original Islam and whatever additions were made to it later. He saw and predicted the dangers that could result from misconceptions and ignorance. And so it was with a sense of duty that he approached the task of writing this book. Most of the chapters of this book first appeared as articles in the Qatari magazine at Doha in the late 1970s and early 80s. And eventually their publication led to the expulsion of the Egyptian editor-in-chief, Raba al Nakash from Qatar. These articles were subsequently compiled into a book, and the leader Muslim Hazim went on to win the award for best book in the Cairo Book Fair of 1984. The full title of the book is Dalil al-Muslim al-Hazim ila muqtada suluk fil qarn al the sorrowful or sad or despondent or perplexed Muslim's guide to appropriate behavior in the 20th century. The sorrow felt by modern day Muslims, he explains in the first chapter, is the result of being pulled in two apparently opposing irreconcilable directions. On one hand, the demands of their religion as they understand it, and on the other hand, the demands of modern life. Sadness also arises from them witnessing the decline of the Muslim civilization, which in almost every aspect is lagging behind the non-Islamic developed world. The book goes on to explore fundamental issues that have formed and twisted the Muslims' understanding of their faith, such as the role of the ahadith, the prophet sayings um, that are ascribed to the prophet, Muhammad's biographies, the position of the clergy, Islamic sects, Sufism, and other topics. The book was met with great acclaim in the Arab world for being one of the first books to address such vital and current issues head on and with such force. It was also met, as might be expected, with some fierce attacks from fundamentalist Islamist sides. For example, for suggesting a more critical look at the history of Hadith collection, or for calling for reopening the door to ijtihad or independent interpretation of legal um, sources, or just generally for suggesting that Islam today that the Islam we have today is the result of a multitude of ideological, political, and historical factors which we need to be aware of. He published several other books over the next few years which continued to garner praise and cause outrage, including among others, Hawla Dawa ila Tatbiq al-Sharia, on the call for the implementation of Sharia, which dealt with some more contentious Sharia-related issues, such as whether or not the hands of thieves should, should be amputated, whether or not hijab is an Islamic requirement, um, and other issues such as how dogs are perceived in Islam, and so on. He also wrote his widely commended, commended autobiography entitled Fibayt Ahmed Amin, in the house of Ahmed Amin, as well as a play, compila compilations of short stories, no, compilations of stories from the, from the Torah, or heritage books, and essays on a wide variety of topics. Dalila Muslim al-Hazin, now in its 11th edition in Arabic, may have been written over 30 years ago, but its message, its call for reform, and its warning of the consequences of inaction are timelier and more relevant than ever. 
now that the dangers have become ever so clear, we can see the debate finally taking place at the highest level in countries like Iran. <coughs> we felt that it was also time to bring this message to a wider non-Arabic speaking audience so that it may play its part in the much needed debate on Islamic reform and on what it means to be a Muslim in the modern world. And it is with that sense of urgency that we embarked on the translation, my cousin Yasmin and I. As we always say, it's been a labor of love with as much emphasis on the labor part as on the love part. The translation presented continuous and exciting challenges. There were occasional frustrations, which made it all the more gratifying once we were able to resolve them. The draft versions were going back and forth between Yasmin and me, and the comments in the margins made for very interesting reading in their own right with discussions taking place on how to best approach the translation here and there. These were accompanied by long hours over the phone. Not recorded, unfortunately. <laughs> so there was a constant dialogue with ourselves and with each other to find the translation most suitable for the, for the particular context. We debated on numerous occasions whether the translation should preserve certain Arabic language norms and patterns of cohesion, or whether we should stick to English language patterns. We asked ourselves what freedoms we can take. Where it was impossible to find a concise English equivalent for a certain concept in Arabic, we often chose to leave it in transliteration together with an explanatory footnote. Or if the Arabic term itself was less vital and a footnote might have been an unnecessary distraction, we chose to paraphrase it, thus losing the conciseness. Decisions had to be made on a case-by-case -case basis after assessing the loss involved in the translation and how best to compensate for it. For the most part, our strategy was to produce a translation that achieved a balance between being faithful and idiomatic. While faithful translations have some merit, merit in bringing the reader closer to the style and language of the author, the problem with a translation that's too faithful is it may end up sounding unnecessarily exotic. And so we sometimes resorted to a more concise, tighter phrasing, occasionally even reorganizing sentences to reach chunk information, or getting rid of semantic repetition of synonyms, which in Arabic is a well-known stylistic device. But there were exceptions, namely when we felt that the author's choice of style and devi deviation from natural syntax, or the expected word choice, appeared purposeful and had a function in the text beyond the simple communication of ideas. To give, one, to give one small example, the author ends the chapter on Abu Lahab with the sentence, Wallahu ba'da dhalika a'lam bima arad, and Allah knows best what he intended. A sentence which you would not expect to see in a sober scientifically researched article, but which may be more in line with the style of traditional fiqh writing. Another prominent example is the final chapter, which is an imaginary letter written in response to a friend who supposedly criticized the book. The chapter stands out for its particularly flowery language, reminiscent of classical Arabic writing. Had the whole book been written in this style, we may have opted to tame it to facilitate legibility in English. But because the author chose to give this chapter such a distinct flavor, we decided to at least endeavor to reflect the style in English. We did, however, insert a, a translator's footnote to sort of warn the reader of what was coming. In cases like this, we felt it would be a betrayal of the author and his purpose if we were to try to achieve a more natural-sounding, domesticated translation. Another challenge we had to deal with is the issue of referencing in the Arabic book. A lot of it has, of course, to do with the Egyptian publisher's inadequate referencing conventions and requirements. However, I also suspect that some of it has to do with my father's general approach. In real-life conversations, I think he genuinely assumed that much of the vast knowledge he had accumulated over decades of reading was simply common knowledge to other people. So in conversations, he would say things like, and as you know, of course, Ibsen was a strong supporter of women's rights, leaving his interlocutors at once feeling a bit ignorant for not knowing who Ibsen is, never mind his attitude to feminism, as well as feeling humbled by the thought that he actually assumed that he had all this knowledge. <laughs> and so similarly, when he wrote, he rarely bothered with footnotes or annotations. But as translators, of course, we couldn't do the same. We encountered in the text verses by unnamed Arab authors, um, references to obscure events, paraphrases from unnamed works of well-known writers, etc. To give one example, in chapter two, we found the following sentence. Montgomery Watt, 
writes in the introductions to his books, Muhammad at Mecca, Muhammad at Medina, and What is Islam, as well as in Richard Bell's introduction to the Quran, that he tried to take a neutral position between Christianity and Islam. This sentence is then followed by several quotes and paraphrases from Montgomery Watt, without further reference. So this for us involved visits to university libraries and endless poring over the four books by Watt to find the quotes, or indeed the ideas in question, in order to render them, to back translate them accurately. In the end, however, the whole process was an incredibly rewarding experience, and we hope that we succeeded to some extent in our attempt to do justice to the author and to his book, both of which are so special to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Jasmine Ami. Now I don't see your cousin. Um, she's the other translator of the book and is currently finalizing her PhD in Islamic studies at Exeter University on humor and laughter in the Hadith. She obtained an MA in Islamic studies from the American University in Cairo in 2010. Her research interests are the history of Hadith criticism, ethical reasoning and gender issues, as well as various aspects of early Muslim society and culture. Her publications include two forthcoming volumes, Musnad on Salama and the factors affecting its evolution, and Islamic interpretive tradition and gender injustice, processes of canonization, subversion, and change. Please. So since I'm uh, studying Hadith, I've been assigned uh, to speak about Hadith tonight. And um, not just because I work with Hadith, but I believe that the Hadith chapter spills over into loads of chapters that are going to be discussed by uh, further speakers. So I'm going to first start with a quote from the book. Uh, and it says, faced with this massive geographic expansion, and the pressures of the new historical and ever-changing conditions, as well as the differences in time and place, the Muslims and their jurists sought guidance on how to deal with all these new circumstances. It was only natural for the piety to lead them to seeking guidance at the same source, the source who, was, who received the revelation and proclaimed the divine message. But unfortunately, despite this piety and despite this need to resort to the Prophet's example, we all know that the Hadith was not 100% authentic and there are actually collections devoted to fabricated Hadith. So um, when people claim that they have the Prophet's real statements, it's not necessarily so. Uh, the Sunnah became the second source of law and um, during the first three centuries, there was no codified law. And the jurists were um, holding court and deciding upon using their own knowledge and also their own discretion. The law only became codified around the fourth century. And attempts to raise the status of the Sunnah to Quranic rulings was done pretty early on. And um, they said the Quran is finite, we only have 6,300 and something verses, so we need more varied information to be able to rule on topics that the Quran either doesn't address or leaves vague without a clear-cut uh, decision. So why did they fabricate the Hadith? They fabricated the Hadith because of many different reasons. Some of them are sectarian conflicts. So. For example, after the split into Sunni and Shia, the Shia fabricated hadith to raise the status of Ali ibn Abi Talib or decrease the status of the others like um, Osman or Omar or other rulers. And the opposite was also true. Um, they used it to defame people. Like, for example, there will come a time when a, there will be a ruler called Walid and he will be the most horrible man. Not you. <laughs> well, he is a lovely person. <laughs> um, 
um, they also fabricated a hadith about virtuous deeds. Like, for example, if you read such and such chapter in the Quran, you will receive a house in heaven. Or if you do um, so and so many readings of the same verse, then all your sins will be expunged and things like that. And this happened especially after the civil wars when people were kind of ambivalent. Okay, so why are Muslims killing each other? So um, they stopped reading the Quran, they stopped doing the rituals. So mainly the Sufis tried to bring them back into the fold by forging these um, hadiths called as virtuous deeds. There are also a big number of hadiths that deal with prophecies, like uh, there will come a leader so and so, or there will be a civil war then and then, and these people will be victorious or these will lose or so on. And of course the Quran is very clear about this, that the Prophet doesn't have the keys to the unknown. So he wouldn't know these things. But hindsight is 2020, so forging these hadith to support a particular reading was also done. Then of course there were the hadith that were forged to support a certain doctrine. Like for example, um, um, the Hanafi school, there will be a guy called so-and-so and he will be the best one to judge this and that or to defame another one from another school of law. There were also um, hadith forged to support something that was illegal. Like for example, one of the caliphs was in love with a pigeon racing, but this was gambling. So he paid someone to really, really look for a hadith that would make this kosher. So they came up with if the racing is by wings or hooves or sandals, then it's okay because then it's not gambling, it's a skill, not given to chance. There were also the storytellers who forged a lot of hadith to um, enliven the whole thing and they had these circles in the mosque and even in the marketplace where they told stories about things that were not in the Quran or that the Prophet did not deal with. Like for example, the people of the cave, they had a dog. So discussions went on and on. What was the color of a dog? Was it a female dog or a male dog? Or when they sold Yusuf or Joseph to the to native traders, how many dirhams did they pay? Were they silver dirhams or gold dirhams? There are things that aren't really that important and they will not change any particular direction of anything. Um, they had a particular love and fondness to tell stories about the prophets of the Old Testament. Um, Solomon's donkey, what was its name? Or um, the bone that was used, which part of the body did it come from? And all these, of course, are so ridiculously unimportant that I doubt that the Prophet would have spent time saying things like that. Um, they also um, developed later on the chain of narration, which meant that they would be sure that so-and-so told so-and-so told so-and-so that he heard from the Prophet, so they had this entire Isnad chain to make sure that the Prophet really said that. But at times, there were people who were 300 years old centenarians who actually couldn't have been that old, but they couldn't find anyone to fill two gaps, three gaps, so they just invented this person who came from India and was 630 years old, and he had met the prophet in person, so there was no need for a chain at all. And of course, longevity is highly questionable, especially at that day and age. Um, political factions, geographical locations, certain uh, new customs from newly conquered territories, all these crept into the hadith and, and the corpus became so huge that at the end nobody really knew did the Prophet really say that or not. And then this is when they started to sift them and make the compilations that we know today under the name of Sahih or authentic compilations. Um, I will read another quote from the chapter, and it says, Therefore, the most sacred duty of any religious reformer seeking to lay the foundations of proper Islam and to go back to the pure origin of the religion 
is to address and eradicate all what has been imposed on the hadith, the lies, and the concealed purpose-oriented additions. I'm going to end with giving you one example of a hadith that I particularly like because it is so obvious before, but it's very entertaining. And uh, it also leads into what Dr. Azam will speak about, the Prophet's biographies, and also what Dr. Uh, Stenberg is going to talk about, Sufism. So the hadith goes that the Prophet was with his companions on his way to battle, and um, they lost their way in the desert, and they were the provisions were almost finishing, and they were afraid that they're going to die from hunger. <laughs> And one of them had the bright idea, let's slaughter our mounts and eat them, the camels, the horses, whatever they were riding. And then Umar ibn al-Khattab went to the Prophet and said, we can't do that because if we do that, we'll be stuck here forever. We will not get out. So um, what are we going to do? So Umar said to the Prophet, deal with it. So he prayed and then he put his mantle on the floor and told everyone to bring whatever was left of the provisions. And he prayed or, uh, and put it on the mantle. And he prayed over it. And all of a sudden, the food started regenerating. And whatever they took out of the food increased and increased more. And there was no end to it. And everyone ate. They filled their saddlebags. And then he repeated this with the last sip of water that they had. So obviously, this. The miracle of the Prophet Muhammad is not in things like that. He, his miracle was the Quran. He didn't uh, make the blind men see like Jesus or he didn't part the sea. And he had no physical miracles. But of course, with the newly conquered territories, they needed to ascribe miracles to him so that he was equal to the other prophets. So they just put this in that he said this or he did this. and. This was also a way to later on raise the status of the Sufi saints that who had baraka, or to embellish the Prophet's biography uh, to make him even more interesting of a person than he was. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Minds of, of how students can sort of enhance stories about their teachers <laughs> and spread them in, in nicer and nicer swelled up versions. Um, we have a third speaker, Paulo Banca, who has written the introduction to the book and who is currently Associate Professor of Arabic and Islamic Studies at the Catholic University of Milan. His research interests include contemporary Islamic thought, especially Egyptian thought, modern Arab history, and Islamic radicalism. And his, public, his, many, his many publications include, among others, his Italian book, Bocchi uh, della Islam Moderno, in English, Islam and Modernity, an Anthology of Muslim Righteous. Please. Thank you. Ya Hussein, Ya Ahmed, Ya Hamid, Ya Hanuka, Allah, Rabbil Alameen. I'm a Ba'ath. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. Uh, it's a great uh, honor and pleasure to me. In my first speech, public speech in London, <coughs> my life. <laughs> uh, I'm a simple um, scholar. Um, uh, uh, of Arabic and Islamic studies uh, from Italy, but uh, I think uh, uh, this uh, opportunity is not by chance. Uh, uh, so I thank uh, the uh, Arkham Foundation for this good, uh, very precious uh, initiative and event. But I uh, thank also uh, our Lord, because uh, sometimes he writes um, his way, <laughs> our destiny. Uh, I wrote uh, the introduction of this book because uh, some years ago I met um, Yasmin Ali in a 
international conference in Barcelona, the Middle East uh, Studies, the Middle East Studies Association conference uh, from America and, and European uh, specialists. And uh, uh, I found out she was of the same family of my favorite, <laughs> favorite uh, Egyptian author. By the way, I was uh, there to give a speech about Arab humor. Uh, and I think it's not by chance, because uh, really, I think uh, uh, this uh, uh, issue is related with the book we are presenting. Uh, the only mm, word I I don't like in the title, nor in Arabic, nor in, Arabic, nor in English, is the sorrowful hazin, because really in Egypt I, I, I found out uh, very smiling people. <laughs> As you know, uh, Egypt is very uh, famous all over the world, the Arab world, as a producer of the best jokes. Egyptian people smiling, are laughing about anything, anything. Don't don't think that you used to uh, look or smile about uh, superficial thing. It's the opposite. We used to have a humor about very serious issues, like men and women, like politics like war, like violence, like religion. Hmm? Uh, and this is very good because uh, uh, we are human. Hmm? And uh, if you understand the paradoxical and contra contradictory nature of the human experience, you must smile. The only way out is smiling. The only help us illness is stupidity. And sometimes we find very stupid people, very strict. They know only one thing, and maybe a wrong thing. <laughs> but in the book of uh, Hussein Ahmad Amin, uh, we found a, a deep wisdom wisdom of a simple, common Muslim. He was not a, a scholar uh, of religion. He was not a theologian. He was a big personality, of course. We, we, we had the witness of uh, which kind of family, which kind of uh, studies, which kind of uh, career. But uh, Religiously speaking, he was not a specialist. He was only a common, intelligent Muslim, using his brain, his heart, in order to understand, better understand his own tradition uh, without closing any door. Uh, and by the way, I, uh, I do remember a hadith I like very much in, uh, in which uh, the Prophet Muhammad said uh, maybe a Muslim can uh, be a sinner, maybe a murderer, but a Muslim layaklib is <laughs> not a liar, cannot be a liar. To change the language, to change the meaning of a text, of a message, is not allowed to a Muslim. As you know, the oral tradition, uh, how it's important uh, all over the Middle Eastern uh, civilization and religious tradition in uh, uh, our heritage. By the way, <coughs> uh, this is not uh, an issue of the, the book, but uh, I wonder uh, and ask my students, many times. What do you 
think about humanity before the um, invention of, of uh, alphabets. Without books, without writing, humanity lived thousands and thousands of years in this world without alpha, beta, gamma, delta. <coughs> By the way, A, B, C, D. By the way, Alice, Bar, Jim, Dal. By the way, <laughs> Alice, Beth, Dinner, Dalet. So we speak in the Mediterranean area the same music with the same sounds in the same order, but we don't learn that in the schools. We, we learn, uh, we have to fight each other because we use different shapes for the same sounds. So I, I found in this book and the other books of, uh, by uh, Hussein Ahmad Amin uh, a witness of wisdom and mercy. Al hikmah wa rahmah. I think without mercy, without uh, uh, knowledge, without uh, wisdom, there is no religion at all, at all. We, 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 we look, we are looking for rules, for something you can't change to, to feel yourself uh, stronger, but it is wrong. Because every time, every, everything in, uh, in the world is developing, changing mm? with the place, with the time, with the kind of people. And I wonder why religious knowledge should be just to stay blocked and all other kind of knowledge develop and change. This is a kind of stupidity. You, you, you close your religion, your belief, in a, in a prison, without the possibility to evolve. Not to change, but to remain, to uh, apply, to uh, give life to the same basis principle values in a different context, no text without context. Sometimes we find some people in every religion pretending to read it to understand a text without his context and to apply the supposed vision to different places and times without paying attention to the context. This is against the human experience. If you pretend your holy book is like a guide, not, not, not the guide of <laughs> by Hussein Ahmad Amin, but the guide of a, um, a wash machine, I'm not a wash machine. I'm sorry. I'm very complicated. I have my contradiction. And my Lord, my Creator, knows that. And when He spoke, He sent a message to me and to our, our, all of us, <coughs> didn't write any guide of wash machine. He spoke like a father, like a mother, like someone who wants help children to grow up with histories, with novels, with legends, with also with something perhaps never happened in the history. But is it an example in order? to uh, make you understand the principle, the moral, the, the, the value. So, 
I think it, uh, it is a book uh, full of sense of humor, the good one, hmm? not the destroying sense of humor, but the, the I don't know, uh, I'm a responsible for <laughs> this change of the light. And uh, uh, finally, mm, I do remember a uh, sentence, very common sentence, uh, some years ago. Egypt writes, Lebanon prints, Iraq reads. It's no more, but, but I think in a way we find in Egypt today, not only Hussein Afdamin, many writers, many thinkers, uh, I can remember mm -hmm. Abu Zaid, <coughs> I can remember also journalists or novelists like uh, Nagi Mahfouz, of course, uh, we have to uh, know uh, better and deeper about them because uh, the, the image of uh, the Arab world and the Islamic world uh, or in the media is very the totally far away from the real nature of this uh, population, especially in our Mediterranean area. And uh, I'm so grateful for this good uh, initiative and I hope uh, to see more and more publication, inshallah. Thank you. so much for enlightening us to the point that the room actually became brighter. <laughs> <laughs> and the next speaker, Abdul Rahman Azam, is a member of the Kitab team. And Kitab is a major uh, European Research Council founded research project based here at ISMC. Uh, we're part of a joint ISMC Qatar National Library project to establish an online corpus of Ibn Ishaq's Sira. Prior to this, from 2007 to 2017, he worked as Director of communication, uh, Communications and as Cultural Advisor at the Qatar Foundation. With a BA and a DPhil in Modern Middle Eastern Studies from Oxford University, Dr. Azam research interests focus on the development of Islamic thought from the medieval to the modern Muslim world and the interaction between traditional Islam and modernity and is among other things the author of Saladin 2008 and the other exile 2017 please Thank you very much. Um, I will speak about the Prophet uh, Barbara in the chapter that Hussein Amin wrote about the Prophet, but perhaps I can start just by saying a few words about Hussein Ahmed Amin himself. And I think really it's the best thing, the way to start is simply to say that to understand the son, one has to understand the father. Hussein Amin is the son of Ahmed Amin, and for Egyptians, Ahmed Amin is a colossus, a giant of Egypt's writing and intellectual media. Collectively, Hussein Amin and Ahmed Amin covered the whole of the 20th century Egyptian politics, history, and intellectual life. It's actually quite a symbolic symmetry because Ahmed Amin died in 1954, so you almost missed the century and a half, and of course 1954 is two years after the revolution. So Ahmed Amin's life covers Sa'ad Zaghloul, it covers Mustafa Kamil, it covers the struggle against the British, it covers Ahmed Amin's saw the abolition of the caliphate. Intellectually, it's the, it's the world of Muhammad Abdu, of Rashid Rida, of Taha Hussein. It is a, it's a world where Ahmed Amin starts as a young man dressed as an Azhari, dressed in Islamic Azhari dress, and ends it dressed as European, when he was actually the dean at what is now Cairo University. As for Hussein, it's different. Hussein is a, a generation of the Nasser, 
is you know, the Egyptians who suffered the trauma of 67, who of course, as, as she was saying, grew up in the 1980s under Sadat and Mubarak, and actually lived long enough to see the Tahrir revolution. Intellectually, he was not writing in a vacuum, and he was writing as a diplomat, and he was writing at the time, two years after this, uh, two years before this book, President Sadat had been killed by an Islamist group. So this was not an academic exercise. This was a time when Egypt was fighting a bitter war of attrition against Islamist groups. It's the time the president was killed. It was also the time of the Iranian Revolution, which shook the Middle East profoundly. And it was also a time when Egypt itself was ostracized after Camp David. So there was a lot of soul searching, and this is reflected partly in Hussein Amin's writing. So although both Ahmad and Hussein Amin were pursuing the same goal, which is the reconciliation of traditional Islamic knowledge with modern liberal humanist thinking, there is a difference between them. And the main difference, I would say, is that Ahmad Amin was a traditional Azhari, and throughout his life, he retained a certain loyalty to the Azhar. Hussein Amin was born at a different time. He perhaps not had the same loyalty. So although Ahmed Amin talks about the missing link, which is the link between the two, Hussein Amin talks about how the past holds the present hostage. And this is reflected in Hussein's writings. I mean, he's a brilliant writer, I must say. Um, as Hussein is saying, his, his, his references are just astonishing. His Western references, his Islamic knowledge, his knowledge of poetry. I was fortunate because I wrote the book in Arabic, and I was just you know, breathtaking how brilliant his Arabic is. But he was writing a different style. He didn't have the traditional scholarly style. He didn't have the, what I'd say, perhaps the sense of proportion that an Azhari would write with. And he was writing, I would also say, in a slightly provocative manner. There was some satire there. He was trying to challenge his readers. He was trying to shape them. He was trying to tell them, look out, this huge danger happening. So there's an attempt to shock. And sometimes this was, uh, and that's why in many cases the book was perhaps received negatively. Not because he himself was um, trying to be provocative, but because the topics that he was discussing were quite challenging. And sometimes I think Hussein Amin went too far. Sometimes I think that there was a big lack of sense of proportion in his writing, and sometimes it felt that you could see it was more of a journalist, perhaps more of a diplomat writing, rather than very sort of staid Asani Sheikh. I'll give one example. He talks about, again, referring to Yasmin um, Zerfus, the Hadith. Yes, of course, there's fabricated hadith. We all know that, and of course, we know about the forged hadith. We know that the forged hadith because of politics, because of interest, sometimes for fun, sometimes for money. But then Hussein Amin, having written all that, concludes, I think, this chapter with a sentence that, and this led to complete chaos. And for me, I love the first, first bit, but when I get to the complete chaos, I can't stop. And I think it led to many things. But hadith literature was not in complete chaos. I think one can argue that there was chaos, but it was somehow not. Similarly, in his reference to um, Sufism, he, refer he makes a reference in saying that, of course, um, many of the Sufis focus on divine love in order not to perform their rituals. And at the same time, he also says that if the Prophet were to return, he would not recognize many of these Sufi shapes. And again, I know what he's trying to say, but the way he says it can sometimes jar a bit because, of course, it shows a slight disrespect to some of the great Sufi sheikhs who, of course, had a tremendous love for the Prophet and, of course, were very disciplined in their rituals. Coming to the Prophet, the Bible of the Prophet, he actually says, Hussein, it is high time for the Muslim world to produce a new biography of the Prophet, a biography that is not defensive, nor apologetic, nor ashamed, a biography that al tabari would have written were he alive today. He also says, we are in desperate need of the biography of the Prophet that does not blur or fabricate facts. We need to exclude the forged hadith, even if hadith as a whole should suffer as a result. Now this really comes to the heart of the matter, and this is where I slightly again disagree with Hussein Amin on this one. Putting aside the whole question of whether it is possible to write a biography of the Prophet, no more then it is possible to, let's say, write a biography of Jesus or of the Buddha. Can one really write a biography now, after the passing of centuries? It comes to the core of the question. If you look at Tabari, if you look at the early Asira writers, and as in the middle writers, of course, Ibn Sahak mentioned the Tabari, Ibn Sa'at, and Waqidi, and he's absolutely right. These were the original um, 
subjects. He mentions all of these of course, prior to that, he talks about the seal of all of these of I don't think that all of these of actually um, wrote Sira, I think Alpha wrote Hadith, so that's the technical point. And I agree completely with what he says when he talks about how over the centuries, especially in the 20th century, a lot of the biographies of the Prophet were just sentimental, apologetic, defensive, and trying to appease perhaps the West. And that, for me, I agree. Where I disagree, I'd say, and I, you know, I'd love to have met him to challenge him, to have learned from him, is whether Al-Tabari himself would have understood what Hassanami wanted to happen. So what Tabari knew, what the Dishaq knew, is that they, there's a lot of things they did not know. They did not know what the Prophet said. They did not know the words of the Prophet. They understood the gist of what was being said, and they imported that meaning. Hassan al-Basri himself actually wrote that if I were to quote the hadith, what I knew exactly what the Prophet said, word for word, I would only ever quote two hadith. Mm. And that is why, scattered in the whole Islamic Syria literature, they have this phrase which is repeated again and again, Allahu Akbar, only God knows. So that search for historical veracity, which dominates perhaps some of his enemies writing, and of course later writers, which is almost a binary supposition that something is either right or wrong, would not have been understood by early Muslim writers. They would not have seen it in the same way. For them, the aim was not to write the Bible of the Prophet. For them, the aim was to <coughs> describe the spiritual charisma of Muhammad. It is to show what it must have been like to have lived at the time of revelation, when the heavens spoke to man. It must have been as an example of spiritual guidance and so forth. As for the details, the exact details, the granular details, which the modern scholar is looking for, that is not going to be found anymore. And that is why these early Muslim writers have absolutely no problem in using naive hadiths, weak hadiths. Because it has to be emphasized again and again, a weak hadith does not mean it's not true. A weak hadith simply means that the isnad is disputed, but it, the map is could be true. And they have no issues at all. Why did they use these hadiths? Because they were anecdotes. They were wonderful stories of the Prophet on the campaign and so forth. One should also qualify this by saying that when it came to sort of judicial matters, the hadith had to be sahih. But on other matters, the ma'azi and so forth, there was not laxity, but there's a book of generosity of prophets. And that is why when we talk about the biography of the prophet now in the modern world, I don't think that's possible. I think what we're doing at Kitab and what we're trying to do is simply try to put together a corpus of Mishab, perhaps a corpus of Tabari and Isham to show where the different contradictions were, to show where perhaps there was repetition, where there's some nuanced differences, and allow the historians to interact with that. But to write the biography, I'm not convinced. Having said that, I totally respect Dr. Hussein Bin's thinking about it. In 1983, and this is just a very quick point, I, think I don't know if you actually read the book, but I think you would have been very impressed there was a biography that came out in English in the 1980s. It was by a man called Martin Lins, who wrote a biography of the Prophet of Abba Sarajuddin. And I think he would have loved that book. And this is, I was very fortunate, because when I was starting my career in publishing, I met with Martin Lins and I read some of the work he was doing, and how he approached and interacted with the early sources. Both the respect that one has to show them, but also the skepticism that one has to also show them as an academic. But ultimately, what he came to the journey that all his forces, like playing chess, he was almost checkmated by the fact that when you write about the Prophet, when you write about any sacred figure, Allah, Allah there are things that we simply do not know, and we have to simply show as much as we can what the Jews have lived at the time of the Prophet. But the historical details will always be slightly elusive. If I have time, I'd just like to make another very quick point. He writes about the Western writers on the biographies, of course, and very well, I think absolutely brilliant, spot on, one comes in what and so forth, but he also talks about Dante. He talks about how Dante placed the prophet in the lowest circle of hell, and that's, of course, very interesting, but what he doesn't mention, which is also very interesting, is that Dante places uh, Salah I mean, I've written a book on Salah Hadin, so I'm quite familiar with the situation, the personality. He actually, Dante places Salah Hadin on a higher level than the prophet, and this is very, very interesting, and that is because when the Crusaders went to the Holy Lands and they fought, 
and they came across the Muslims, and they came across Salah al and they met, and they came across as virtue and as chivalry. They could not accept that these virtues came from those of the Prophet. They had to move, they had to separate the chivalry from the Islamic faith. Not because Salah al was emulating the Prophet that he actually was there. They were overwhelmed by how he acted, but they refused to accept intellectually, emotionally, theologically, that it could have been because he was trying to emulate the Prophet. And so Dante places him on a higher circle of hell. And in fact, very interesting at that time, is this whole debate on whether uh, Saladin was actually a Christian. <coughs> because they could not understand how not a Christian could be so chivalrous. So this whole story about him having Christian parentage was interesting. The conclusion, Hassan Amin actually says at the end of his book, any scholar who succeeds in showing us how to meet the challenge of our time in the spirit of Islam is the best Muslim of our time. We will owe him the greatest debt of gratitude. I'd just like to say that we all owe a debt of gratitude to Hussein Ahmed Amin. In fact, I would say we have a debt of gratitude both to Ahmed Amin and Sarah to Galal Amin. It's a remarkable family. In fact, they contributed so much to the intellectual sincerity of what is so required today should never be forgotten. And uh, we are now approaching the last speaker, which is Dave Steinberg, who is Professor in Islamic Studies and Director at the Aga Khan University Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. Prior to this, he was Director at uh, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Lund University in Sweden. His research interests are various, uh, but at least various aspects of contemporary Sufism. Islam and modern science, Muslims in Europe, Islamic movements, and questions concerning theory and method in the study of Islam. He has many publications, and among them is an edited book called Sufism Today, Heritage and the Tradition in the Global Community. So, please. So, thank you for the introduction, and in my capacity as a director, I I, of course, take the opportunity to thank our guests, uh, Yasmin, Yasmin, Dr. Abel Rahman, and Professor Branca. But I also would like to thank our facilitator, Professor Utebeck, and our publication manager, Charlotte Whiting. I think you have done a great job in the production of this book, so thank you all for doing it. I'm not at all a specialist in the uh, uh, writings of Saying, I mean, so I'll take a start in saying a few words about the context. It reminds to some extent of the first speaking, and then I will come into the chapter of, of Sufism. So uh, Sadiq Jalal al in his critique of religious thought, originally published in 1969, tried to strip the Islam of the time of superstitious thought and belief in what we can perhaps call stories and folklore. That book uh, was a, a critique of religious elites, their power and role in society, and the ambition of the author to awaken the Arabs. Simply to move on from an understanding of religion that is keeping them away from accepting to its fullest extent rationality and modern science. In the same manner as Al-Assam of Sayyid Ahmad Amin in his powerful Muslim guide, returns to the history of Islam in order to discuss various questions and to denote intellectual stagnation and to promote a position which Islam is significant, but which at the same time is an, affirma is an affirmation of a liberal and secular uh, stance. The idea here is to say that the ideas in the Sorrow of Muslim design can be placed in a discussion about the role of religion in society that has been ongoing in many Muslim contexts for decades. This, is also, this also becomes clear from the Amin's personal comment in the beginning of the 10th edition, in which he states that he thinks that after rereading the book in preparation for this edition, he don't, quote, find a single phrase or paragraph that necessitated deletion or change in the light of the events of the past 23 years, end of quote. However, he did see a need for adding text on two issues being terrorism and democratization. 
in Amin's perspective, the strongest possible way of meeting or refuting terrorism is to establish a quote, strong foundation for democracy, end of quote. And he presents a long list of prominent individuals like Sayyid, Sayyid Hama, Mohammed al sharabi and the Saudi King, King, King Fad, who all expressed the opinion that states should follow the divine Sharia and not the foreign philosophy and practice under the name of democracy. In general, I see the book as part of a tradition of intellectuals that focus uh, discussing the role of religion in the contemporary society. Many of them not trained as religious scholars in a formal meaning, and most of them critical of how religious scholars interpreted traditions and endorsed or opposed practices understood as Islamic or non -Islamic. A view held by many outside the more limited area of the intellectuals, in which they are disappointed on the role played by religious scholars in the general advancement of societies, seeing them as blocking development rather than moving progress forward. Under the surface is the question asked for quite some time concerning why Muslims carrying the last revelation to humans are lagging behind those who received earlier or immature revelations in almost all areas such as finance, military or political strength and in producing socially strong countries founded on welfare systems. Another part of the context is that uh, when the first edition of this book was published in Egypt, Egypt was still shaken by the losses in wars against Israel, but also by eternal turmoil, as for example, which mentioned now for the third time, the killing by Islamists of the President Ahmad Sadat in October 1981. The enemy was no longer defined in state rhetoric as Jewish or Israeli only, or being in an abstract or undefined the West. Now the enemy also came from within in the form of radical and militant Islamist groups and or movements different than and enemies of the Muslim Brotherhood. At the same time, it is to be noted that if the loss in the war against Israel in 1967 became a symbolic year, illustrating the birth of a new and more radical form of Islamism, this year also symbolizes the start of a strengthening role for Sufi movements. And in many Muslim countries, Sufi movements attracted disciples by proposing a religious practice that was, if not comforting, offering a more emotional religious life, giving moments of escape from troubled everyday realities. All this said, in short, to give context to the fifth chapter of the book entitled A Sufism Islamic. Hussein Amin answers the question through a review of the history of Sufism. He starts by making statements about how the companions of the Prophet Muhammad was not entirely in harmony by practicing religious rituals, but also how the Prophet was against the idea of establishing spiritual relationships between humans and the God. In this context, I think it's fair to say that if this early history of Muslims can be evidenced or not, it's not the key. Rather, it is imagined or not perceived as history from a confessional perspective. And it is a strong starting statement to say that, that Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, was against the establishment of spiritual relationship between humans and God. The next part of the chapter is devoted to comments on the impact of the development of what Amin calls an Islamic state for, for how Sufis came to be formed. One element in the description that is important for Amin is that Sufis contains elements that can be traced to other religions and, consequently, it adds rituals or teachings to, quote, Islam, here understood in a singular form, and it points to Greek, Christian, Platonic, Zoroastrian, Indian and Buddhist beliefs, end of quote, that survived in Sufism to new converts after the Arab expansion in today's Egypt, Syria and Iraq. However, Amin points out that the spread of Sufi practices and ideas, rather than Sufism, increases during the Umayyad Caliphate due to the Caliph's indulgence in behaviors not particularly pious. He also points out that the mystical path among Muslims, as in other religions, is focused on the relationship between the individual and God, and that such a relationship is in a tension with the more legal and formal dogmas and practices. This type of challenge to say that the legal, the formal and the ritualistic is not enough a religion has to cater for the sensitive soul. The Jewish logic is not always a sincere expression of religion. It was one of the positive aspects, I mean, regarded Sufism bringing to Islam. The early period of Sufism until the 9th century is then, according to Amin, characterized by extremism. But also a period in which the Sufi experience goes from not only being extreme and, in Amin's words, 
simple forms of skepticism toward developed dogmas. In this part of the chapter, I mean, it's a number of examples of extreme forms of Sufism, and he states that like many other movements and individuals, Sufis interpreted the religious texts in a manner that it supported their religious practices and theologies. In the same manner, he states that Sufis, like others, in their time fabricated hadiths, as we have been talking about earlier, say, uh, and, 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 and in order to strengthen their positions and make what they do more Islamic. In a response to the extreme forms of Sufism, in the forms of abstract thoughts concerning annihilation or incarnation of God, following the guide Murshid blindly, or performing various practices of self-regulation caused the authorities of the time, the Abbasids, to start a relentless campaign against them, which ended by the death of an alleged set to 1922 common era. And again, I'm not going into the historic details if I think this is a historic description that is accurate or not. I'm just considering it as a means presentation of history and, and trying to discuss that. After the extreme Sufism being curbed under the time of the Abbasids, Hussein Amin sees a second phase in the development of Sufism. Um, it, it takes place primarily between the 10th and the 11th centuries a period characterized by the restraining of the Sufi movements. Amin stresses the importance of Al-Ghazali for the organization as well as codification and development of Sufi teachings. And also as a champion in a process in which Sufism grows to maturity. A point here is that he appreciates the moderation and the reconciliation he ascribes to Al-Ghazali um, since he, uh, Amin, appreciates as a foundation for Sufism the need for a catering of the soul and the reconciliation between Sharia and Sufism, law and mysticism, is important to him. In a third phase, he discusses development of Sufi orders, that is, the institutionalization of the Turuk, the orders, and how that created an emphasis on unique Sufi rituals and strengthened the relationship between the Shaykhs and their disciples. Shaykhs becoming an emulation of saints in Christianity, as usual, in regard to institutionalization, a professionalization occurred among sheikhs which made them rich and owners of large estates, making them distance from their beliefs, their disciples. In this point, I mean, points to an aspect that touches on the idea of the many slums, namely how the Sufi orders acted very differently, not only concerning their ritual life, but also how they responded to political challenges and power in various contexts. From the point of the authorities, the need for support of Sufi orders in conflicts were also present. Yet some rulers were also persecuting Sufis. Amin is also describing how one particular order, the Tijaniya, can act differently depending on the local context. In one area, Algeria could be part of the power elite, in another it could be in the opposition fighting to overthrow the ruler. The idea of Sufis as all about love and poetry falls short not to say very short, in this part of the chapter. This part also contains a brief discussion on women and Sufis, which should be accredited to Amin, and he stresses that women can join an existing order and also participate in separate female networks that meet outside the purview of the organization of order, Sufi order. The last part of the chapter, chapter before coming to the conclusion, discusses the, the decline of Sufis. This part is primarily a description of all kinds of sometimes quite entertaining rituals. At least in my capacity as a student of religion, I find the rituals or behavior of various orders entertaining. Others may not. If you think it's the wrong, it, 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 it is, uh, uh, if, if you think I'm wrong, I can perhaps blame my English skills on this one. <laughs> but to those who are familiar with the rituals of orders revering cats, or drinking alcohol, walking naked through the city at lunchtime during Ramadan, stating that this will give humiliate and crush their self-pride, it is somewhat entertaining. <laughs> In my mind, the important thing is not if Hussein Amin is describing the development of Sufis in a manner that would be approved by scholars on Sufis. The important aspect is, as I see it, beyond understanding the context of the book, rather if this is a general notion of Sufism in the Egyptian society of the time, and how we should think about the reception of this chapter in the book. Many of the religious scholars that refuted the book strongly were powerful religious leaders, aligned with the leadership in repressive states. 
and also religious leaders with a leaning towards Sufis, as for example the Syrian Sayyid Ramadan al -Buti. In one other, in one of the other aspects, uh, Hussein Amin's writing triggers something. It hits a sensitive spot, and some, in the case of this uh, chapter, Sufi leaders feel, in my mind, I think, threatened. So how is the question answered? Is Sufism Islamic? Instead of clearly answering the question, Amid adds a new one. What has Sufism added to Islam? Amin's answer is that Sufism has made a service to Islam, exposing the whole of understanding of Islam of legal jurists and scholars. He is also humble in the sense that he states that he will only judge Sufism in its golden age. But even in doing that, and at the same time pointing out that Sufism fills a gap, religion cannot be only ritualistic, it needs an inner core. The important thing for Amin is to combine the two, an inner core and religious and legal practices. Sufism, in, in the perspective of him, did not return to the true Islam or remove the many accumulated and invented dogmas and practices that have been added to it in the name of Islam. In the end, he prefers even Taimiyya instead of al Ghazali. This stated in the respect that he is not in favor of innovations, and I think that's the part of the relation to Ibn Taimiyya, and the Sufi heritage containing elements from many traditions and religions. He repeats the relationship between Sufism, Buddhism, Christianity, Suryasanism and a number of other religions, but he also used the appreciation of Sufism among European scholars as a negative connection, undermining Sufism as Islamic and seeing it as something between Christianity and Islam. In the end, if Sufism is Islamic, it is um, it's answered by no, it is not. And, as Amin says, if the Arab world should rise again after the de defeat 1967 to return to the right path, it would be despite the popular Sufi trends that he, that he, had, that he sees as permitted the Arab world. But perhaps Amin opens up for a Sufism, keeping religious scholars in check and make them not forget that import, the importance of the inner and the outer aspects of religion. So, uh, using Abdul Rahman's phrase, uh, soul searching, yes, I think it's part of a soul searching and it's very clear in the Sufi chapter how that relates to a, 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 a context. But uh, by promoting a modern Islam, in this case, an Islam that is also intimately related to liberal and a dem liberal and a democratic society. But again, allow who else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, if you don't want to read the book after these introductions, I don't know who you are. So, and there is the opportunity of both looking at the book reading a bit of it, but also buying it later. But first of all, let's again thank the panel, with him of course. And uh, I'm especially grateful to the panel for, for bringing me back to Egypt. Uh, I ended up in Egypt when I was only 21, as a tour guide from a small city in Sweden. I ended up in a big city, Cairo. And I encountered so much from what you are, have been talking about, all of you. Uh, the very clever tradition of Cairo, the jokes, uh, the street smart taxi drivers, the passionate academics, Madbouli's bookshop where you can stand and, and just awe at all the books. And I spent a lot of money there and carrying heavy bags at home, books that are now to be found on the internet. That's almost an insult. The Hadith collection of Bukhari that I carried in my back, uh, backpack and, and things like that. Uh, but not least, the, the tradition of smartness, the, the novelist, the irony, the, the cleverness, the way of, of cheating the reader and pulling the legs of the reader and the, the will to vulgarness, the will to shock. It seems all to be there in the book. So thank you very much for reminding me of that. We have 10 minutes for questions. Not more than 10 minutes, but we have the privilege of 
asking, well, we can go possibly a little longer than that. But I guess all the authors will be with us at dinner. So you can ask them uh, personal questions then. But we do have a microphone, and we do have the <coughs> opportunity now to ask questions. And there is a man in the second row already. And I'll try to see if you now wave a little up. <laughs> uh, I just uh, very interesting to I think very enlightening is the issues have been raised. I was wondering whether 1967 war, defeat of Arab army by Israel, was a shock to the Arabs as well as to Muslim and the rise of uh, Sayyid Qutub and the fundamental you say, aspect of Islam has anything to do with uh, the host of problems you see which arises for instance uh, currently uh, those uh, very uh, die-hard uh, Al-Qaeda or ISIS and all that sort of thing uh, you see the resurgence of the highly politicized, for instance, in uh, the, the Lahore uh, in Pakistan, recently about the apostrophe and the case of killing there. Uh, can anyone think, give me a broad idea whether Zed Kapu was a, Zed Kutub was a uh, person who created hell of a problems? <laughs> Bring the microphone up. Oh. Oh. So if anyone wants to reply to that, I think that microphone will take up the sound. I mean, the only comment I'd make, I mean, I have absolutely no idea how to answer your question, but the only comment I'd make is that 67 was a colossal defeat for the image that Abdel Nasser built for Egypt and for the Arab world, the superhero, the superman these of Egypt of you know 56 and Suez but don't forget that 67 uh, was quickly assuaged by 73 so the pride that was lost in 67 was regained in 73 how far you one wants to read it through an Islamist reaction I don't know I think it was more of a nationalist defeat of Nasserism and the Nasser ideology but maybe my colleagues can have a different opinion Maybe you can ponder the question a bit and we'll give the word to the man with the um, Just a minor point stimulated by the reference to Dante. Um, I'm sure uh, learned members of our panel know how Professor Miguel Asin Palacio, um, a scholar of Islam in Spain and a priest, actually traced um, the influence which uh, both Ibn Arabi and uh, some traditional popular Islam had on, um, uh, I refer especially to the notion of Mirage, uh, had on the, um, the Divine Comedy, which maybe in a sort of uh, torturous way is a reference to both Mediterranean influence, which uh, uh, the professor was also referring to. So I find that absolutely fascinating. The Palacios and Narvi was of course from Andalusia, so the whole origin of that can be clear. But of course, the Palacios work was heavily criticized by the Catholic Church precisely because he argued the Islamic roots of Dante. But of course, the link which people said was lacking between Dante and the tradition in question was later found. Now we know that Dante very probably had access to that narrative. So but yeah, also, it, also, it also goes back to the point that the Crusades brought back a lot of knowledge. Not just the Salah al-Din myth and legend of which I've mentioned, but of course all the intellectual debates, they must have come across a lot of mixture, and these ideas were transported back into Europe. And of course, after was the Russian philosophy, it's a very important point, this was also the contemporary of Arabic. Can I just ask your audience, can you hear what the speaker says? Yes, okay, great. Please. Hi, I'm uh, from Basira for Universal Women Rights and allow me to play the devil advocate because there are a few bits doesn't seem right to me. Number one is that uh, 
you have said that there is a hadith about the Prophet who says that Muslims do not lie. Um, in a brief nutshell, what do you think of taqiyya? Okay, that's number one. Number two, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Abdul Rahman Azam, you are saying that uh, about the hadith, considering in the 21st century and we are, we are digging up and we're finding so many contradictions between the hadith and particularly that the Prophet himself has said, don't write anything after me. So why, why do we need to look at the hadith? And the other point is that uh, recently there has been a, a new image coming up from Yusuf Zidane about Salah al-Din. All the ethical position he showed with the, with the Salibin, with the Crusaders, has been wiped off completely with the way he, he treated Egyptian and you know, and what did he do? So please enlighten me. Thank you. Yusuf Zidane. In my opinion, Yusuf Zidane showed not just disrespect, but total ignorance when it comes to Salah al -Din. Um, I spent many years studying the life of Salah al -Din. I really don't want to get into the whole Yusuf Zidane thing, but I saw him speak, I heard him speak. I don't know why he does it. Is it to make a name for himself? Is he trying to prove a point? Is it just controversy for controversy to say? Facts. Uh, I've written facts, he's written facts, and we could have an argument about it. No, he's disrespectful of Salah al -Din. Salah al -Din would not be Salah al -Din unless his legacy has endured for a reason. What he did to the Fatimids was actually extremely humane. His, you know, the idea about the library, which he Zidane talks about. Look, one of his criticisms is that he separated the Fatimid men and Fatimid women, so they did not have kids, so therefore they died out. And he thinks that's cruel and barbaric. To me, that's incredibly humane. Compared that is Zengi would have probably slaughtered them. Yeah. So I don't think. I think I'm a great, great advocate for Salah al-Din. I feel very precious to <laughs> Salah al-Din. I dislike Yusuf Zidane's criticism intensely. The point about the hadith. No, I did not say that. Um, the, the fabrication. I simply said that to call it complete chaos is going too far. Hadith is without the hadith, we would not have Islamic law. We would not have the jurisprudence. But the Islamic law is not really suitable, I mean, especially when it comes to women's rights. Islamic law may, really, may not be suitable, but let us at least be respectful and say that Islamic law has endured for one and a half thousand years uninterrupted, so it must have been doing something wrong. It helped Islamic Ummah from Indonesia to Morocco, so it must be doing, so we have to give that its respect. Now, where I, this, where I agree is that one can, Islamic law is also extremely flexible. If one does not want to pass a certain, if I was a chef, I did not want to do something, I would go to the Hanafi Bethab and change it and I'd do it. There's an enormous flexibility within Islamic law. There's a nuance and a subtlety of Islamic law. I think the danger in modern Islam are those people who are insisting on focusing simply on the Sahih Hadith and who are trying to strip a Bukhari and Muslim from the Hadith because that is very reductionist and that is dangerous. I think Islamic law is one of the miracles of Islam. I think the fact that it's endured, the fact that it's confronted with different challenges, theological, military, political, the fact that it's held the Islamic world together is remarkable. Look at Ibn al He travels the Muslim world. He can enact law anywhere. Women were protected under Islam. Whether they could be more protected or not is not the question. Were women protected under non-Islamic law? Probably much less. <laughs> And uh, I, I'd like to add something. When you said, why do we need hadith today? Yeah. Because, first of all, the Quran says, Ma rasul what, what the Prophet gives you, it's you take. Written 200, 300 yes, I know, after. but that doesn't mean, even if it was written 200 years after the Prophet died, that does not mean that all of it is forged. We, we just have to look at it critically and not decide beforehand that we're not accepting any or we're accepting all. Each single hadith should be revised critically and then the decision made anew of whether we are going to believe this or not. So, of course, we know that the isnad was perfected, so you could forge a hadith and then apply a perfect isnad to it. But that doesn't mean that all of them were forged. So we, we have hadith that we cannot do without, actually. About taqiyya, <coughs> I think it, it is a possibility and by uh, necessity, especially with the Islamic or non-Islamic minorities. 
have to hide their identity to avoid uh, attacks and uh, um, risks. But uh, the, the, the rule, the normal rule, is uh, to say the truth, mm? to not to be a liar. So uh, we, we find in every uh, religion the, the general rule and the exceptional um, application for necessity. About Dante and Salah uh, as you know, uh, Dante, uh, during the Crusades, during the Crusades, he was the, the poet of the Christianity, Middle Eastern Christianity, then put uh, three Muslims in the hell, but in the limbus, <laughs> out the, the hell, uh, even Rushd, uh, even Sina, Usalah had been the chief of the enemies of the Kuwaits because he recognized in Salah al-Din a model of a good ruler more than the Christian one. So this is a kind of application of Kul al-Haq wa lawkan Say the truth. Even if you don't like, even if someone doesn't like. So I've got three speakers already, so I won't take any more uh, questions as of now. Let's see how long these three speakers need and how long the replies can. Maybe we'll break after that or open the floor again for new questions. Um, thank you very much to all the panel speakers and for giving us a great insight into the book. It seems like a very interesting read. Um, the only thing is myself, my, I'm Dr. Islamuddin, I did a PhD on Muslim family law. So one of the questions that comes to my mind, and I know yes been very well, Marshall, over the years, and I didn't really realize you came from such a wonderful family. May Allah give you a barak and your family, and, and may Allah mercy on those that passed away. Well, being introduced to two great, great academics or thinkers in the name of Hussein Amin, and uh, uh, Ahmed Amin as well, mashallah. I'm just wondering, did they write about the issue of women in society? And because this is one of the big topics at the moment, one of the things that I'm doing at the moment in this, especially as two women have translated this great work, it's amazing. So there's, there must be this sort of great tradition within the family, maybe you want to say what it was like to live with your relatives and so on. And, or just basically share with the thoughts whether there was a reason, if it's in the book or not in the book, because I can't gauge whether there was this issue of discussion of women in society in that book, if you don't mind. And to the professor on the end, if you don't mind me asking, obviously, I'm an imam as well, and I write a lot about uh, the Prophet Sallallahu and quite often um, the most popular um, bible seems to be Arahik al-Muqtum, which is the seal nectar which is published from Mecca. And you mentioned Martin Lings, which just just come across now. I'm just wondering, in your opinion, what is the best biography that you found from your you know, years of reading, if you don't mind as well. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to say something quick and then Yasmin will give a more elaborate answer. Um, uh, he has written about women and I think uh, more so in the following books like in How the Dawah al Sharia there is about uh, the hijab and other, other issues about relating to women. Um, I just remember something that he would uh, often talk about which is uh, especially about family law uh, that uh, the fact that uh, over the centuries there was much more um, readiness to evolve law uh, whenever the circumstances required it, but whenever it came to family law, there was such um, there was the scholars were very adamant about not changing the family law, and that's because the men who actually you know wrote the laws uh, wanted to preserve their rights vis-à-vis uh, -vis women, and so he um, he was quite a feminist in that respect, and uh, yeah. I want to add one thing about my our grandfather. He didn't really write about women, but he was also a very um, strong supporter of women. My aunt um, was sent to study mathematics in France in 1939 because there were no universities that accepted girls in Egypt. And he thought that she shouldn't be penalized for being a woman. 
because her brothers were sent to study abroad as well. So even though he didn't really write about women or women's issues in his books, unless they showed up within the context of the historical uh, uh, periods or thoughts he was uh, dealing with, but uh, he had a great respect for them. The Sharia is discriminating against women, their property rights, uh, uh, the hudud, and all that sort of thing. Not Sharia, Islamic law. <laughs> What's the difference between Sharia and Islamic law? Can we come back to the law? Yeah. Sharia is divine, but Islamic law is man-made. So, between Sharia and Islamic law, there are two steps that are usually missing. Because, pe because the clerics in particular, they don't want you to realize that this is man-made so that you don't discuss it. So the, the God's image of how a Muslim society was supposed to live is the Sharia. Then to translate it to Islamic law, you had two steps in between. First, usul al-fiqh, which are the principles of jurisprudence. And if you like, this is the framework they used to... No, this is the methodology they use to translate the divine into human. And then the next step is al-fiqh, jurisprudence, and this is the framework in which they pushed this methodology. So there are two steps between Sharia and Islamic law, and this is why the Islamic law can be uh, discriminate, discriminating against women, whereas Sharia is. Thank you. Um, just that one point. Um, Ahmed Amin is your grandmother. Was okay. a no, your, your grandmother okay. is a remarkable lady. And I think if you were to read the autobiography of Ahmed Amin and uh, his wife and the way the respect that he showed her, what an incredibly formidable. She was not an educated lady, but she was a formidable woman, and the respect her children all showed her. It's also extremely funny. Parts of it's very, very, very funny how she used to um, run the house. <laughs> Um, just a point, I'm not an expert on early Sira. I wouldn't be able to answer that question. The reason I so love the Martin Ling's book is because he was he was a great Arabist, so he obviously understood the early Sira, the search sources, and he read all the Arabic. But when he came to write it, he made a decision that he wanted to capture the language at its height, to capture the spirit of the Prophet. And so he chose to write in English at the time when English was at its height. And for him, this was Shakespearean English. And it worked between. I would recommend you read it. It's a, it flows with his tutor. Well, I should say he was an Oxford-educated man, and his tutor was C.S. Lewis, a great author of Narnia stories and so forth. And the reason I just love reading it is because of the beauty of the English. And I think it's definitely worth reading. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, very interesting presentations. Uh, my name is Abby Day. I teach religion at the Sociology Department of Goldsmiths, University of London. Um, and I'm trying to get a fix on this book in terms of its curriculum. Um, to what extent do you think it would serve the interests of current students who are looking not so much at Islamic theology, but looking at the place of Islam in the world today and reflections as it appears in the flyer here about modernity, about practices? I'm just wondering if it was published or written originally in 1983, to what extent do you think it is still or has been updated to be relevant and for what particular level or type of students do you think this is aimed at? So I'm sorry we will include you. I think I can answer two points. I think it's very interesting to, to think about this book in the sense that it's but why is it translated now and why is it translated to English for the first time uh, right now. Uh, I think there is a forgotten tradition of thinkers who are from a kind of, what you say, secular, liberal, democratic perspective, but whether they have that uh, or, uh, or, or kind of opinion on, as we have been discussing, uh, uh, hadith or, or women, doesn't really matter. But I think the discussion has been forgotten, especially in many of the, the media, that's in the sense that so much is focused on radical Islam, that that type of tradition has been, has been simply wiped away media-wise. And uh, uh, so therefore I think there is an actual, uh, this book is actual uh, today. Uh, and it also gives a kind of perspective of the debate that I think was important 
uh, from the whole of the of the right man, and I, as we are not agreeing fully on the meaning of 67 and 73, but what you can say is at least that there was a discussion of the law of the Legion Society in the 70s and the 80s that was on, and it's mirrored in this book, uh, the, today's discussion. I don't see that the arguments, if the, if the foundational arguments are not different. I think it's the same in foundational questions that they are trying to solve today as he is trying to solve in this book. So therefore, I think the book has an actuality. But again, and, and I'm, I'm stressing the, 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 the fact that it's actually the first time this book is translated into English, but a book that has caused so much tension and debate and is printed in so many editions in Arabic. So my question is, is we could want to ponder on when you walk home, why? Thank you very much. Uh, I think the, the concept, uh, concepts are always subject to the dynamic changes taking place in society and politics. And therefore, the law must keep pace with the changing situation. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I presume that we can go on forever. There's been at least a number of people uh, signaling to me, dip in, dip in. That will probably, we will need an hour or something like that. But we do have a lovely buffet waiting for us. And some of us are probably waiting for that more than others. So I think let's once again give the panel a great applause and join us. In the